in this session is Miriam Meyerworth, she's a lecturer in music um, at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Her PhD work was on improvisation and network musical performance, or NMP. And um, today we're going to get uh, a presentation about NMP applied to ensemble activity for isolated musicians. Thank you very much. Uh, great, so um, I'm going to talk to you um, a little bit about um, yeah, access to ensemble activity using network music performance. Um, probably in a slightly different context maybe than what we've talked about before. So I'll talk about what NMP means in terms of my research, um, some of the opportunities and challenges for people working in this way, um, how we particularly use network music performance at the University of the Highlands and Islands that's in Scotland, if anybody's wondering, um, and also what the implications for um, web audio, because obviously that's why you're here. Um, so actually, uh, having listened to uh, Jesse and Tony, I've got a slightly, I suppose, different uh, approach in terms of network music performance. So here I'm talking about um, streaming uh, live instruments. So it's kind of broken down to two kind of uh, sections, synchronous, so live performances, um, which can be used for either performance itself or rehearsal, and also that's um, kind of with audio, and sometimes with video as well, depending on the particular uh, setup. Um, but also importantly, I think um, asynchronous network music performance is also very important in terms of accessing um, ensemble activity, um, particularly for people who aren't quite so uh, techy as maybe the people are in this room. And so that's more um, helpful in terms of um, recording a final product, for example, if that's your interest, rather than um, the kind of uh, collaborative and um, kind of interactive aspect. Um, so my particular interest is in one-to-one uh, -one, um, informal network music performance uh, context. So we're talking about people playing their own instruments um, in their own homes using things like webcams and using the, the kind of audio um, uh, interfaces and things that they already have. Um, and this is what the research I'm going to talk about is based on. Um, so, yeah, believe it or not, there are musicians in this world who do find the technology aspect of... Um, of what we've been talking about. Really, really difficult. In fact, if I kind of talked about this with some of my students, probably either their head, heads would explode or they'd burst into tears. Um, and obviously that's not ideal. Uh, so, um, I mean, I'm talking to the converted a little bit here in terms of what are the opportunities um, for network music performance. But some of the benefits of working in this way kind of domestically um, are that it's accessible to everybody. If you've got a computer and you've got a, a, a network connection, then you can do this and if you play some music. Um, having said that, there are still places in the world and certainly in some parts of Scotland uh, where rural broadband is a real issue. So that sometimes has a bit of an effect, but um, that's getting better all the time. So as I said... There's domestic solutions to this. So um, yeah, you can work just using a laptop. You can even use the webcam and the microphone on your laptop to actually do this. Um, and also, as you all know, there's some great creative opportunities in terms of network music performance in um, using the, uh, the acoustic of the network in, in creative ways. Well, I'm not going to go too much into that because unfortunately there are some real massive challenges with this. Um, the first one, which everybody thinks of, I think, straight away, is the technical uh, challenge of um, latency. And actually, I don't think that this is quite as much of an issue as possibly people think that it, that it is. And there's ways around, um, around that, and musicians can deal with it fairly easily because um, they're actually used to dealing with latency in, in live performances just through the distances. Um, uh, involved in music performance. And if anybody's ever played in, in an orchestra, I'm a percussionist, I'm right at the back of the orchestra, um, latency does have a big effect. Um, so there's, there's ways that, um, and approaches that musicians can take to deal with this. The one that kind of seems to happen the most naturally in, in this one-to-one -one situation is musical leadership. So if one musician takes leadership when they're playing and um, they focus on their own kind of internal metronome um, and they play consistently, then the, set, the, if the other person in the collaboration can listen to them and play in time with them. So for person two, they hear the sound coming towards them and they play in time with that. So for the second person in the collaboration, so the follower, they hear just a kind of normal musical situation. For the first one, they hear themselves and then they hear a delayed version of the, the second person. So that can be a bit off-putting, but it's something that we do quite naturally anyway when we're performing. It's just we're talking about like larger latencies. So that seems to happen without too much thought. 
um, when in these kind of situations. And the other way of dealing with this is by the artificial addition of um, latency so that you can um, add latency so that people are playing to a I don't want to say common beat, but they're playing to a, a pulse that won't be actually the same for the two people in the collaboration. And that have a big impact on the music that they play. So those are ways of getting over latency. So the next thing is the musician's experience. And actually, that's the thing that I was most interested in um, in terms of my, um, my research. And undoubtedly, it's different. I think it would be very um, disingenuous to say that it's the same as playing in a room together. It's definitely not. It's a different experience. For example, you're using uh, webcams, you're using monitors that you wouldn't have if you were playing a room together. And also, one thing that's quite important is that you've got a connection that you're switching on and off. If you're playing in a room together, you've got that time when you walk into the room, you, you have a chat, you tune up your instruments, and then you start. Whereas with network music performance, it's very much a case of connect, and then you're on, and then disconnect, and you're suddenly off. So you don't have that kind of transition between the, the kind of discussion and the actual playing. And this affects interpersonal relationships, which are, as anybody, anybody who's ever played in an ensemble will know that those relationships between people, between musicians, are actually a really, really important part of playing together. Um, so in, in these kind of situations, they need a bit more effort, and they, they need um, the musicians to be very aware of the fact that they need to build up these relationships. Um, and the leadership, that musical leadership that I mentioned, uh, involves communication and negotiation. And again, these are things that can be built up over time. So the next uh, kind of challenge is around communication. So if you think of two musicians playing together, the communication has got two aspects. It's got what you transmit and what you receive. Um, so the transmission might be your body movements, and it's also the music that you play, so kind of gesture comes into this as well. And then what you receive are those two things. You see those body movements and you hear the music. And both aspects of that can be affected by network music performance because um, you've got the limited view on the screen, you say for example using a webcam, if you're using video at all, and also you've got all the, the kind of artifacts that come along with streaming music, um, which also impact on what the musicians hear. But what's really interesting about um, this is it's going to have an impact on coherent performances. But the great thing about network music performance, and so when I'm talking about coherent performances, I'm talking about uh, timing, tuning, and dynamics in particular. But what's great about this one-to-one -one situation is the question of who actually judges what is a coherent performance. Because if you're playing with an audience in a network situation, then the audience will judge that. But if there's just two people, then actually, does it really matter, I suppose, is my question, of whether you're dead in time with each other or whether your, um, your dynamics match each other. In some situations, it will. But in other situations, it probably doesn't matter too much because um, you're the only two people in the, that collaboration. And again, it's different to playing in a room together. Um, but I think these things are probably less important than what we might think. And another aspect of communication is the use of video. So a lot of these systems will use video, but what I've found is that actually video, it is used while musicians are playing together, but it's much more used when musicians are discussing their work. So before they start, and once they've played something, they'll discuss it and evaluate it. Um, and that is when the video is most useful for the musicians because of the latency aspect. Um, the video is used less for the kind of critical timing aspects of uh, playing music together as it would be in a room together. So when you're performing, you tend to look at each other for cues and things. But obviously that doesn't work quite so well in uh, networked music performance. So another aspect um, that is affected is the kind of music that, that is played um, in this situation. So remember, we're talking about musicians who are playing their own instruments who are picking the music that they want to play. So, as we probably all know, there's certain things that work better in these kind of situations than others. Um, one is the rhythmic content. That's really important. So, kind of steady music with a set pulse works really well in this because, obviously, going back to the latency, that's, um, you can deal with it a lot easier than music that's changing through time. Um, and also, kind of really free music where the pulse is kind of less important. So those work really well, and things in between, so for example, classical chamber music is quite tricky in this situation because you've got lots of changes of time, uh, for example. And another thing that I found um, is that 
creativity and risk taking are definitely affected by using this uh, kind of technology. So musicians will tend to play safe, as they, as they say. So um, they're less likely to take creative risks because they're afraid that they won't be able to kind of follow through with them if their timing isn't quite right or if they can't quite communicate with each other. Uh, so, I suppose, why do I care about all of this stuff? Well, I care about it because obviously ensemble music is great for individuals and also for society, um, but also I uh, work with musicians across the Highlands and Islands, and this is one of the ways that we can connect together and we can play together. So um, that, that map is deliberately quite small, actually, with all the blobs on it. Um, so that's a map of Scotland, and all the blobs on that, um, on that map are kind of hubs as part of the University of the Highlands and Islands. So the students who go to these different hubs, or a lot of them work at home as well, and they can access their education. And the university does all sorts of subjects, but one of the ones is uh, the applied music degree. So network music performance is a really important part of this because it allows the musicians to play together when they're not physically in the same place. So has anyone actually been to the Highlands and Islands? I know a few people mentioned they have. So uh, the conversations I've already had about that is that transport's quite an issue. It takes a long time to get from one place to another. Although physically, it's probably not that large. It's the, the kind of infrastructure makes and the geography makes it quite difficult to get from place to place. So, for example, we have students who are up in, Scar uh, sorry, up in Shetland, which isn't very far um, north there, and that's a 12-hour ferry ride to get there from Aberdeen, um, and then obviously all the transport from there. So having a way to be able to perform together when not physically in the same place is very important. Um, so we do, we do um, recognise that, that being together is very important. So we have uh, residentials throughout the year where all the students get together. But in between, we teach using video conferencing. And some of the students also have um, Skype instrumental lessons. If, say, for example, our students in Shetland want to access music uh, tuition down in Glasgow or Edinburgh, then they'll use um, Skype. And we also have collaboration partners for different residentials. Um, so, what's quite interesting about this is that this gives us a great opportunity to use some of this technology, but as I mentioned before, most of my students, if I talk to them about kind of music performance, their heads explode or they burst into tears. And, and the technical difficulties of doing this is actually the biggest barrier. So we do a lot of asynchronous collaboration, that's fairly straightforward. The musicians can record themselves, they can share their work. But when it comes to actually live network music performance, this is really, really difficult. Um, and it's not that the software doesn't exist to do it, it definitely does. But to, for those students to be able to access that is really, really difficult. And I don't have any answers for this, and I would really hope that some of you do. Um, and one of the major things is, um, so they might, we've used uh, Soundjack, I don't know if anybody's used that, but um, we've attempted to use that, but the biggest barrier to that is all the router settings and getting the students to port forwarding and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I kind of sense that this, uh, the idea of live network music performance is very much for technology enthusiasts and probably not quite so much for musicians who, who just want to play together. Um, so um, my question, next question then is why should you care about this? Um, well, I think it's important to understand how musicians, so musicians who just want to play their instruments, how they... Um, kind of perceive this and also the kind of things that happen to them when they're actually playing like this. So the first thing is that, as I've mentioned, latency might not actually be the biggest issue when it comes to network music performance. So I think there's a, I don't really want to use the obsession, but it's almost like uh, latency is the biggest thing and this is what we have to deal with. But actually, I don't agree with that. And I think that musicians can deal with a lot more latency than you might think they can. So I would say maybe if we can put that to one side and look at some of the other issues, that'd be really, really great. Um, so another aspect of this is how, the, um, how you want musicians to use the software. Um, so for example, if you, want, um, if you want the timing to be as perfect as possible, then you'd probably use, the, the, you'd probably use a um, si uh, system that delays signals more and you can kind of match the timing up. But actually, that will very much affect the music that gets played. So um, a lot of my um, students are traditional musicians, and they just want to play tunes. They just want to play things that they're used to playing. So if you add latency to that, then it becomes impossible to do that. So um, yes, yeah, 
making a system that has additional latency or musical content. So maybe if you can think about something that doesn't try to do that artificially, then that will change the musical content that gets played. And another thing I very briefly mentioned it, which was um, the use of video in the uh, network music performance system. So obviously, if you're using video, then you're going to increase the bandwidth requirements. Um, but I would argue that you can actually have a video um, aspect of this. It's very important. I think it's very important to have some video in it because it allows for that interaction, the interpersonal relationships. But I think from a musical point of view, you don't actually necessarily need it. So my suggestion would be to have a mu uh, video that you can switch on and off um, either be difficult to do that automatically, but so that musicians, when they're actually playing, they can just uh, switch the, the video off, um, which will allow the, um, the audio to take priority. And I suppose the final issue is, if you do decide to have video, do you want to synchronize that to the audio feed? Because that's going to have um, uh, additional impact on your latency of your audio. So those are my, um, I guess, questions for you to think about. And if anybody's got any thoughts on this, I'd be really interested in, in talking to you. Um, so just to conclude, I suppose, um, I think that meaningful musical connections can be made using um, typical domestic equipment and broadband connections. And I would really like to see a very, very simple one-to-one -one system um, that doesn't assume any technical proficiency on the, on the terms of the users. And that is all I have to say, apart from thank you very much for, uh, to the, um, the diversity funding uh, for this conference who helped me get here. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. There's time for questions. So if anyone has one, let me know. Yes. Thank you for the talk. That was really great. Um, I'm kind of curious at what level of musicianship this ability to compensate for latency comes in. Because I know like for a beginning musician, it is very difficult to play out of time with someone. And it would be very difficult to imagine people not falling into what they perceive to be lockstep, but actually being out of time. And I'm curious yeah. if you know like, or how you would imagine developing that skill over time? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. But it tends to be, I haven't got a definitive answer to that because I think it would be quite difficult to measure that, but it tends to be that this works quite well for sort of kind of slightly experienced musicians, not beginners, but also not professionals as well because it gets to a point where if, say, I've worked with quite a lot of classical chamber musicians who are kind of like, no, I can't work like this because this is not what I do. And it's so difficult. Oh, I can't do it. But it tends to be the people who haven't quite got to that level of kind of ensemble playing that are much more open to accepting this. Um, and it's very much about attitude of like, can I do it? Yeah, I think I can. And then you probably can. Whereas if you get to a certain point beyond that, we know that I can't do it. And also, as you say, for beginners, it's just like totally impossible. So yeah, it seems to be sort of somewhere in, in the middle of kind of before you've got to that really, really highly um, uh, honed ensemble playing. But once you're beyond uh, kind of like struggling with actually playing your instrument, for example, that was my percussion thing, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, another question there. Hand up again. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, <clears throat> you, I think uh, since the delay overall can be an obstacle, but it can also be a creative tool that a lot of musicians use, maybe the solution to the delay in uh, online performances is that you actually hear both. You hear yourself in, in uh, right now and the delay as well. And then you, if you can use it as a creative tool and others can uh, tune to the one that you hear after time, maybe that is the solution to that. Maybe that will be the different kind of music to play, but it will still be the music that you can play all together. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good suggestion. And I think it also comes down to sort of like, if we're thinking about a system that someone's using, maybe educating the people who are using it is that 
yes, you will hear this. It's not a fault with the system. It's something that, because bear in mind, we're talking about people who are not particularly technical in a lot of cases, that this is a feature, and this is exciting, and you should be really happy about this and, and using it, rather than, ah, this is wrong. This is not, not right. I can hear myself. So, yeah, totally. Uh, any more questions? I've got one, but I will let anyone else take take the place. All right, my, my question, I might have missed it, getting distracted by other things I was doing, is what technology are you using predominantly right now to achieve this one-to-one -one thing, and does anyone in the audience have suggestions for alternatives? Yeah, well, uh, Soundjack is the one that okay, I have so tempted you. Yeah. Okay. Um, but all the, actually, because it's so difficult, the research that I did, I actually had to um, kind of simulate it by using protocols and people in different rooms and adding latency and stuff. So actually, I, can, I haven't found anything that's really kind of easy to use and, and accessible. So, okay. yeah, if anyone wants to come and talk to me after, please do. <laughs> yeah, I'll put links in the Slack for things to, to try out. Okay. Let's thank Miriam um, once more and Jesse if you want to come up and set up. Thank you.